You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Before we get started on our fantastic show today with Lana Korchik, we have a conversation that I'm going to play for you in the beginning with Harry Wallet from Relay Publishing. Uh, Relay is doing some really exciting things in, in taking a new approach to storytelling and book marketing. I think that you guys will find this uh, quite interesting. So uh, let's get into our conversation with Harry, and then we'll uh, send it over to Lana Korchik and talk about her book, Sisters of War. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I am super excited to have Harry Wallet on the show with me today. Harry is the CEO of Relay Publishing, a company that is doing some really exciting things in the publishing space right now and really taking a unique approach to storytelling and story publishing. And uh, I'm excited to have you on the show today. Uh, welcome, Harry. Thank you, Hangmi. Harry, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? That, yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I mean, for me, uh, you know, I wasn't super into to reading when I was a young child. Uh, I had a pretty late start actually getting into books. Um, I think my parents would probably describe me as a bit of a wild child. Uh, I didn't really have an interest in sitting, so that wasn't uh, completely uh, conducive to to kind of reading books. But um, I, I think it was one of my teachers that said, Harry, I think you'd really like this book. Um, I took it home after school uh, and yeah, just basically devoured it in, uh, in an evening. And uh, I remember one scene in particular, uh, it was a fancy book about this boy who kind of gets uh, lost this magical world and uh, he befriends this huge creature uh, and they kind of spend a few days together and um, the, it, they end up getting chased by these other monsters uh, and this kind of creature um, that he's befriended uh, ends up dying, um, you know, in a sacrificial kind of manner. I just remember being so impacted and, and you know, just really brought to tears by this, this, this scene. Um, I remember my parents coming in to think I'd, you know, back flipped off the bed again or, you know, broke a limb <laughs> in some way. And, uh, no, I was just uh, sitting down look, looking at this book and, uh, I mean, they were probably as shocked as I were, as I was, um, because, you know, books weren't really my thing. And I think from that kind of moment, I've always seen books and stories as a, as a bit of a magical kind of item. Um, and I've always kind of wanted to kind of recreate that same feeling in others. Um, and also, I guess, the fact that there's there's someone behind this magical item that can just, you know, create such strong emotions and feelings in you. And, you know, that's a storyteller. And, you know, I was never much of a writer myself, but, I, you know, I grew up around a lot of really good storytellers in, in my family. So kind of I tuned my mind, my ear to, uh, for, you know, good stories. And I've always liked, you know, spending time with, with writers and storytellers. Um, I, I kind of, you know, they're so creative and hardworking, you know, obsessed with their craft. And, uh, you know, those, those qualities and traits are something I really admire and appreciate. And I knew I kind of wanted to spend more time and make a career, hopefully, um, with, with kind of storytellers and writers. And I've been quite fortunate of Relay to, to kind of do that. So you have a um, a background in marketing, is that right? Hmm. Yes, correct. Yeah. So what what got you into marketing? Uh, first off, because I, I know that you uh, you have a degree in history, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yes. What what brought you over to you know because because marketing is is storytelling in and of itself. It's it's communicating something to people to get them excited for a product or a service or or whatever. But you know that's a that's a really unique skill to to get people excited to to turn loose of their money. That's a uh, that's you know that there's no better form of storytelling than that if you want to get down to it yeah i mean you're 100 percent right hank and you know good marketing is just telling a good story um 
and I think the way I got into it was um, I've always kind of had a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit and uh, wanting to kind of, I guess, figure out people's problems and, and try and solve them. Um, and that's how I kind of got into the marketing side of it and, you know, working with businesses. And then from there, I kind of started working with, with writers and editors, um, and kind of getting into the world of publishing and fiction. I mean, book marketing is, is a very interesting space. Um, I mean, it always has been, but particularly at the moment, uh, with, with you know, Amazon really, making uh, it a lot easier to publish and kind of get books in front of readers and, you know, kind of uh, ensuring that readers get, you know, the story that they want and making sure these books are discovered. Uh, it's a big challenge uh, from a marketing point of view, uh, but also a really fun one as well. And, you know, there's nothing better than, you know, selling a good story and getting readers excited about that. It's, it's really fun in my opinion. What was your first experience uh, learning about uh, Amazon and the uh, the changes that were having that were happening in not only the way that we uh, promote and sell books, but maybe the way that books are created? When did you realize that there was, um, you know, kind of a sea change happening in publishing? Um, so it was 2010, if I remember rightly, the the Kindle store first kind of got right. going and Amazon started it's been 10 selling. years this year. It's, it's crazy <laughs> that it's been a, a decade now. Yeah, it's it's amazing. And, you know, they're always tweaking and improving things. But yes, it's 10 years, I think, uh, they've had the Kindle release for. And I was one of the very first to pick up um, those Kindle devices. I don't know if you had one of those uh, as well. well I, I still more... have one that I read every night while I'm laying in bed. <laughs> yeah, they're just so much uh, easier to read from. You know, these big hardbacks you used to get, you know, your arms get sore, you have to keep on changing position. So, yeah, I really love my Kindle. <laughs> uh, and well, I've still and got it one. helps you not to get a broken nose from those heavy books when you start falling asleep. <laughs> too. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And it just allows you to read more, I think, you know, just because your arms don't get as tired. So you can kind of go those extra couple of chapters, which uh, is always good, I think. Um, but yeah, so the, the Kindle, um, when that first came out, I got one almost immediately and, you know, just kind of downloaded so many books onto it and just started reading through that. Um, and, and then I kind of noticed, um, that the kind of the reviews for some books, people would really were quite honest about what they, they liked and what they didn't like. And, you know, it was just normal people, not some kind of snobby book critic, um, kind of giving their opinion on it uh, and, you know, what the real readers thought about books. Um, and, and I think that changed a lot, uh, for me in terms of uh, a publisher and someone who's interested in books. And, you know, from there, I kind of started looking at what was missing from the market, what were readers, you know, saying, they wanted but wasn't out there because when the kindle store first started um it was quite a small amount of books available um you know compared to today when there's millions and millions back then there was probably just a couple hundred thousand so it was quite a narrow market and and readers they did want you know stories but they just weren't available so that was kind of the trigger for relay to kind of get started and and for me to kind of really start looking at what readers wanted and kind of dig into that a bit more. So, so tell us about the beginnings of Relay. What was, what, uh, you know, you, you see this opportunity with this new platform, um, it, it kind of, you know, but, but then there's a, there, there's a bit of a jump there between realizing there's a, a new opportunity and then saying, I'm going to take advantage of this. And I think I have something and I have a way of doing something that, that, readers might be interested in, but not only readers, writers as well, and, and really merging these two groups of people. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's quite a, you know, uh, unique beginning because there's not many businesses like this. There's, there's not many business models that kind of do what we do. So, I mean, normally when you kind of start something, you kind of look at competitors or people doing similar things, uh, there wasn't that kind of model to copy. Um, and I mean, I mean, there is in other kind of artistic industries, like, you know, if you want to commission a painting, you can go to an artist and kind of give them quite a, a detailed breakdown of what you want and just say, hey, can you, you know, paint me this picture? Um, with, with books, that there wasn't really that kind of model in place, um, at least not widespread. So for me, it was just, you know, looking at my network, looking at contacts, uh, once I had a kind of idea for a story in place and 
um, I was sure readers kind of wanted that story. Um, then I was just, you know, kind of finding writers and, and talking to them about the project and talking to them about what I wanted to do and, you know, where I think this would fit in the market. Um, and, and, you know, the first book was in 2013 and that was a, uh, kind of YA fantasy book. And, uh, that was just really kind of hitting what I thought was a big gap in the market uh, and getting writers and editors on board. Uh, and there was really an experiment. I, I wasn't really expecting anything big to come from it. Certainly not what really has become now uh, as we're approaching a thousand books published. Um, uh, and yeah, that first book, it was a real experience, the learning curve. Um, but, uh, the end result was really great. And it's one of my favorite books probably, uh, you know, to date that, that I'd read for pleasure and read for fun. And, um, yeah, that was kind of the start for, for us. And since then it's just grown and grown. That's awesome. So there are uh, a number of companies that help writers, uh, you know, edit their book and get it mm -hmm. prepared for publication and then kind of hold their hand through the process of, you know, self-publishing and then promoting and, and all of that. But Relay takes a little bit of a different approach to uh, because you guys really collaborate with people on the writing, on the marketing, the editing, the whole nine yards. Kind of explain a little bit about what Relay's business model is and, and how you approach the marketplace uh, and, you know, kind of what people can expect from you. Sure. Um, happy to. So I, I guess a little disclaimer from the start, this is definitely not for everyone. Um, and we, we completely understand and appreciate that. Um, for me, Relay is a, a story creation studio. Uh, and what that means is, you know, we build stories from the ground up. Uh, we spend a lot of time, you know, speaking with readers, you know, researching, uh, spending time in reader groups, all that kind of stuff, essentially to answer the question, what's next? You know, what do they want to read about? What characters, what settings, what plot lines? Um, and from there, we kind of build a, a premise document that, you know, kind of lists all those kind of key elements. Um, the next step then is a really detailed outline. Uh, I mean, we're talking 50 to hundred pages, 40,000 words, really just detailed. And that's done by in-house team. Then after that, we, we kind of bring in a commission writer, um, who we paid, uh, a fixed rate and to kind of flesh out the outline and create the story. Um, and so that's where I guess would be most of interest to, to your readers, uh, sorry, your, your listeners. Um, that's the kind of role they would play in, in this process and, and what they'd um, be most interested in. And then once the manuscript's written, we have a whole editorial stage, which I think is, as well might be of interest to, to your listeners in terms of uh, getting you know, feedback, working on your craft. Um, we work with some very talented and experienced editors. Um, and then once uh, the manuscript's edited, it goes to a marketing campaign. And then to to publish via Amazon, Apple, Google, um, but all the kind of big e retailers out there. So for for most writers, um, you know, it's a very solitary pursuit. You sit in a room by yourself and you come up with, you know, a whole manuscript, a whole story in your head, and you really don't get any feedback until the very end when you go to publish or when you go to submit to agents or you know whichever process you pursue. Um, but there's a whole lot of work that goes in before. Um, any collaboration happens. And what I'm getting is that from with Relay, there's collaboration from the very beginning. Um, have you, what, what kind of feedback have you gotten from people on the process and, and, and how they, uh, you know, enjoy working in this manner? Yeah. Writers uh, and editors love it because it's very collaborative. It's, it's very fun. Um, you know, if you think of a TV writer's room, um, I don't know if you're familiar with that kind of concept sure. of story creation. Yeah. So where you've just got a bunch of people all like, you know, story nerds, just like love story, love story structure, you know, encyclopedia knowledge of just films and books and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and you just sit and you just talk about stories and you talk about, you know, what would be a cool plot point? What's a cool character? All this kind of stuff where, you know, it just makes the process a lot more fun. Uh, and we found uh, a much better end product um, because you're right, it is very solitary and, um, 
you know, you, you know, kind of the, the kind of vision of a, a writer sitting behind a, a typewriter is you know, in a, a kind of cabin somewhere. Um, that's what a lot of people think of when they think of a writer of a, a novel. But we like to do a lot more collaborative, uh, a lot more team-based. Uh, and I think as well, another thing to kind of highlight is that, you know, people have different strengths and weaknesses. So it's kind of very rare that someone who's very good at, you know, the plotting and uh, the details and all that kind of stuff is also equally good at character and setting and world building and all those kind of elements that make up a novel. Uh, it's pretty rare to find someone that can do all of those. And that's why we kind of like to split it into you know, the different stages. So, you know, the outline stage, the premise stage, the manuscript stage, the editing stage, all that kind of stuff is split up. And that's where it really kind of gets its name from. You think of a relay race that there's, there's you know, maybe four people uh, involved in that race. Uh, and, you know, they all kind of have different strengths and weaknesses. Maybe one's better at the sprints, another one's better at the, kind of the start. They've, they've got a good kind of start off the, off the blocks. So, that's kind of what we like to think of with our process. And I mean, it's worked really well and uh, everyone seems to enjoy it. Um, that, that's part of the team. So Relay um, doesn't publish just every genre book. There there are a few genres that you seem to really specialize in. Um, mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit about why you chose the genres that you did and and what these genres mean to you and the company? Sure. Um, I mean, it goes back to that, you know, just knowing the reader. We have a deep um, love of, you know, finding out what the reader wants and speaking to them and really just listening to to what readers are saying, which I don't think a lot of um, publishing houses or, or, or writers do enough of. Um, just, you know, talking to them about what they want from this story. So that's the kind of the starting point always um, with us. Um, and then from there, we have quite a, a data um, led approach to, to kind of what genres are selling best, what genres, um, are kind of un, undersupplied and also, you know, what can we do best in, you know, what, where are our expertise, you know, we've got some great editors on our team, as I said, um, you know, what are their interests? Is, is it fantasy? Is it, you know, post-apocalyptic? Do we have someone who really kind of knows, you know, military sci-fi? Um, and so we put that all together and, from there, you know, we, we pick our next book and you know, you're right. It's kind of a concentrated of some genres. Uh, our main ones are fantasy, romance, sci-fi, and, um, some thriller, or well, that's definitely something you want to expand into in the future. Uh, at the moment we only really publish psychological thrillers. Um, but yeah, those are our kind of main genres and a bit about our process about how we choose them. So what are you looking for in a writer? If someone says, you know, I think I'd like to um, to give Relay a shot and and to work in and, and maybe they want to work in a situation where they can build their writing chops, you know, before branch got on their own and doing their own thing. Mm-hmm. I would think this would be a great place for a writer um, to work as part of a team to really hone in uh, and, and to to build themselves. So what do you look for? in a, in a writer? So there's three main types of writers we work with. Uh, so there's the professional ghost writer who's been doing this for, for decades and this is how they earn their living. Um, this is what they love to do. You know, they know their processes, they know that they're kind of, uh, their strengths and weaknesses. Um, so that's the first type. Uh, the second would be, you know, experienced, possibly traditionally published writers, that are looking for work between projects or, or books. Um, you know, if their publishers got them signed up for two books a year, but they could write, you know, 10, um, then, you know, they're looking to kind of fill that word count. Uh, and then the last one is, uh, you know, self-published writers, um, you know, some experience that uh, books might maybe not making enough to make this a full-time job, but they really want to kind of spend, their, their, their time improving their craft as well as, you know, earning uh, a good living and not having to kind of get, get a job elsewhere. Um, and, and, you know, probably those last two are, are where most of our writers fall into uh, in terms of category. Um, but all of them, you know, they, they come for different reasons, whether it's uh, the money or to improve their, their, their craft and keep on learning or just work part of a team. Uh, everyone's got their own reasons. So, you know, we, we welcome applications from everyone. 
And uh, we'll put links in the show notes where folks can uh, can go to see what openings are available and and uh, apply themselves for that. Um, but Harry, you you said at the beginning that you guys were working your way toward a thousand books published. Um, where can people find these books and uh, and and tell us a little bit about uh, the product that you're putting out? Sure. Um, so our official website is relaypub.com, uh, which I'm sure will be linked. Um, I mean, we, we've got a thousand books now. Uh, I should say this is across three different languages. So that's English, German, and French. Um, and, you know, as we discussed earlier, there are a bunch of different genres, um, fantasy, sci-fi, romance, um, post-apocalyptic. Um, so if you've got interest in those genres, you know, definitely go and have a look at our catalog. Um, we really aim to kind of have, you know, well-crafted books that are character driven. Uh, that, that's a big part of our process. So, you know, if you like kind of seeing characters develop and grow, um, that that's kind of our, our expertise. Uh, but everything is, you know, genre by genre. You know, if you pick up a young adult fantasy, you know, it's very much about, you know, self-discovery of the character, um, and, and, you know, with the particular one I'm thinking of, it, it's a fantasy dragon riding story. Uh, and, you know, the, the bond between the character and the dragon is really important in those books. Um, so, you know, I guess like we, we just try and figure out what the reader wants and, you know, put a fresh spin on it and then give it uh, back to the, the audience. Um, and we've got other books as well. I mean, just this morning, I, I was kind of uh, talking to editors about um, how do we kind of create the next ice age, which is <laughs> quite an, an interesting question. And, you know, just kind of talking about how we'd go about that, um, you know, Elon Musk type billionaires that have imported uh, millions of uh, wind powered um, kind of pipes uh, into the, the Arctic and uh, to kind of uh, thicken the the ice sheets. Uh, so that, that's kind of like the sci-fi story that, that we go for. Or, you know, if you're interested in seal romances or, you know, romances in general, we've got a, a really uh, extensive catalogue as well of those. Um, I mean, seal romance itself is, is quite hard to do because, you know, you're balancing suspense and romance plots together. And, you know, you're trying to get those key moments that are both the suspense and romance to hit at the same time. Um, but yeah, they're, they're fun stories and, and very hard to do to do right. Um, so yeah, just a little taste about um, the kind of stories we do. Excellent. Well, Relay Publishing is one of the the most exciting uh, entries or, or, and, and not a new entry by any means uh, into the publishing world. And um, I think this is fascinating, Harry. And uh, thank you for joining me on the show today to talk about it. And we're going to send everyone over to see you guys, uh, people that that uh, that are creatives and want to be involved in your creative process and uh, readers over to your fantastic stable of books. I think people are going to be pleased all the way around. Brilliant. Thank you so much for having me. Papyrus Author was designed and developed with the modern writer's needs, wishes, and preferences in mind. From big structures right down to tiny details, every single feature of our software has been carefully and meticulously crafted in collaboration with authors. Take charge of your writing with the author interface, which gives you access to different elements of your story, such as characters, backgrounds, and narrative structure. Move sections of your writing seamlessly in the navigator and evaluate the complexity of your text with our expert style and readability analysis. Never worry about losing progress with automated backups. With Papyrus Author, you can be your own writer, editor, and publisher. The world of writing is about to change. Papyrus Author, the word processor for authors, has arrived on the international stage, unrivaled in its scope. It is the first software suite to unite every single step of the creative writing. The vision behind Papyrus Author is to empower everyone with an idea to turn it into a great book for free. A word processing core that matured for over 10 years at its foundation, Papyrus Author goes beyond the text with its intuitive organizing layers for story, characters, notes, and research. The powerful style and readability analysis help raise manuscript quality. The inbuilt publication capabilities take the book directly to the reader with ebooks, docx, and print ready PDF. 
visit papyrusauthor.com to get started today. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Lana Korchik on the show with me today. She's got an amazing book. It's called Sisters of War, a gripping and emotional World War II historical novel. And uh, if you love historical fiction like I do, this is a must-have for your bookshelf this fall. Uh, Welcome to the show, Lana. Hi, Hank. Thank you, and thank you for having me on the podcast. I'm excited to have you. Um, uh, Lana, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Uh, So, yeah, I've always been obsessed with books as long as I remember, and I always had my nose in a book. And as a child, I, I loved rainy days because it meant I could just lose myself in my favorite book for hours and not have to go out and do anything else. And I think I always wanted to be part of that magic. I always wanted to be able to touch readers' hearts the way my favorite authors and my favorite books uh, touched my heart. And I I was always writing something as a child. I was writing diaries, poems. If we had an essay due at school, mine would always be five times longer than required. <laughs> I love that. And <laughs> Lana, I, 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 I pity my poor teachers who had to read through it and mark it all, but that's how it was. <laughs> that's so funny. Uh, Lana, I know that you are in uh, Australia uh, right now, but your your accent uh, betrays you a little bit. It doesn't sound like a <laughs> typical Australian accent. Uh, where Where did you grow up? I grew up in Russia and I moved to Australia when I was 18. Wow. So uh, having having lived in Australia for a while now, what was what was growing up in Russia like, um, uh, you know, obviously post World War Two. Um, but what was kind of what's the landscape like and, and what's the the political climate and, uh, you know, how different is it living in Australia now? Uh, I grew up in Russia when it was still the Soviet Union. I think I was. Uh, 10 years old when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. And it, it, now, now, in hindsight, I can say that, yes, it's very different. Of course, we didn't know any different. So I had a very happy childhood in Russia. <laughs> um, and then things just changed very rapidly in 91. Right. And, yeah. Uh, um, when did you um when did you first start uh learning about World War II and the, these fascinating stories you know based around this time period? Well, growing up in Russia, you can't get away from it because it's in our blood and having grandparents who lived through World War II and they were too young to fight in the war, but uh, they're old enough to remember and uh, I always used to hear the stories that my grandma would tell about the hunger, about having her father fighting somewhere on the Eastern Front and the fear the whole family had for him. Um, And even about the post-war era and how difficult it was to get on with your life. And So that's why I always find these stories fascinating. I'll bet. So, so the there's a, a personal connection there with you and your family. Yeah, of course. Of course. So my great grandparents fought in the war. Uh, my, I, I actually had a talk with my grandmother the other day about that. And she was telling me about her father and her sister uh, who were in the partisan battalion and they both uh, and her sister perished and her father uh, was wounded. And he was he was basically trying to move to the free territories from occupied Ukraine. And he was taken in by a woman who basically nursed him back to health. So he came back from the war, after the war. Um, so, yeah, and it's heartbreaking to hear these stories and realize what people had to go through. Because at school, when we learn history, it's sort of detached. We read the, in the textbook. And right. You don't you don't realize that it 
that to the extent that that, that it's people's lives and what people have to go through. That's a that's a very great point that you bring up that when we learn about it in history mm-hmm. class, especially the farther away from an event we get, um, the what we know and what we we learn in school about it becomes less and less and less because there's just there's not time to go into all of the details. Um, so so yeah, that's um, h- how did you go about learning? Uh, you know, educating yourself on on the intricacies of, of everything that happened? Uh, before I started writing my book, I spent three months just researching the period. And because I can read Russian, there's a lot of documents available in Russian on the internet for free. Uh, a lot of diaries, a lot of memoirs. And I just spent three months reading, which was fascinating. I, lo- I love the research. I, I could I could do it indefinitely. I could just do it for months and months. At some point, I have to drag myself away and start writing. But it's just fascinating to read about people's stories and what people went through and heartbreaking, of course. And there were some sure. really, really interesting diaries that I found. Um, one that made the biggest impression on me was written by a school teacher, a woman living in Kiev. And during the occupation, she worked as a registrar in a German organization, but she used her position to help the local people to uh, make sure they're not, they are not taken to Germany, to make sure they get enough food. And just to think that these people who were writing day to day about the German atrocities, they were basically, they were risking their lives because if these notes were ever discovered, they would have been killed by the Nazis. And that, that just blows my mind that people would be so brave to, right. to live through this period, to do something like that, to document this period. And there's just so much available. Sure. And Everything that I know about World War II and, and all of the, um, uh, the experiences that, that I've heard told of World War II from family members and, and that sort of thing come from a very Western outlook, from a, a very American outlook. Um, being um, someone who grew up in Russia and heard uh, lots of stories from people um, about their experiences with this time period, but from a Russian perspective, um, do, do you think that that helps you to get uh, – a more complete picture of the time period and the things that went on because you do have um, the, the Russian background and, and uh, have uh, access to, to family members and to different connections from, from that side of the war. I'm definitely more familiar with that period from the Russian perspective because uh, of all the stories that I've heard growing up and in the Russian school system. Obviously, we, are, we learn these facts from the Russian perspective. So, um, not as familiar with the Western perspective, but writing about the war in the Soviet Union, I think that definitely helped me. And being able to uh, read those documents in Russian and having lived in Russia, uh, lived in those places that I'm describing because I, I spent three years as a child in Kiev. And so I I could I could imagine what it would have been like. And uh, re- reading about the places I loved so much as a child and still love, but being devastated by war was heartbreaking. But... So Lana, when you start thinking about writing a book, what, what was uh, the first thing that came to you? Was it was it a character? Uh, was it a, a certain um, you know part of the landscape? What, what was it that? Where did the story begin for you? Uh, well, many years ago, I read an article about a Soviet actress, a famous Soviet actress from my favorite movie, the Russian movie, The Three Musketeers, the Russian Three Musketeers. Um, and she, she was talking in an interview, she was talking about surviving the German occupation, uh, only thanks to the kindness of a German officer who twice a day would feed the local children. And, uh, that just made a great impression on me. 
Ukraine. So that made me realize that there is kindness and love on both sides of the conflict, that people are human, no matter who they are, can be human, no matter what situation they're in. And, and I, I, I was so captivated by this story. I knew I wanted to write about it. And a few years later, I wrote a sh short story about that. And that story was published in a magazine. And then a few years later, it became my first novel. I love it. So, you know, a, um, a, a World War II historical novel without without people and their um, unique experiences would just be a history book. Um, but you do show us um, these uh, these situations through the eyes of of characters. Tell us about the characters that we meet in this book, and uh, and and what what circumstances are are they going through when we meet them? Now, well, the book starts on the first day of the occupation when the, when the first German soldiers march through Kiev, and it ends on the day Kiev was liberated. So it talks about the occupation. Um, it a bit to. to Two, two years and a bit. And the book is about a family living in Kiev at the time and what they had to go through, uh, what choices they had to make to survive the occupation. And the main character is a Soviet girl called Natasha. And she meets a Hungarian soldier who is sent to Ukraine to fight for Hitler. But it's a Hungarian soldier oh. of Russian origin, so he, he has Russian parents. And they fall in love. They have to hide their relationship from everyone they're close to. And it p p puts their lives at risk and it puts their loved ones at risk. So they have to make that choice whether or not they pursue this relationship. Mm. Were these characters uh, based on anyone that you knew or any characters that showed up in research that you had done uh, or, you know, how did you, how did, how did you devise these characters? Now, one of the characters, the character of grandfather is actually based on my own grandfather, who is my favorite person in the world. So, <laughs> I had one of those too. So I just dropped my phone. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, yeah. You... Yeah, sorry about that. Um, That's okay. So, Mm. So yeah, my my grandfather was absolutely amazing, and he always had this passion for his work. He he worked as an engineer, he worked as a computer programmer, he worked for the first computers, and even when he was in his eighties, he, he was so passionate for the technology. He he knew more about the new technology than I did, and I worked as a programmer myself. So, and I wanted to have someone in my novel, who is like my grandfather, who would never judge you, but who would always support you no matter what, who would always hold your hand. So I wrote the character of Natasha's grandfather with that in mind. And he's definitely one of my favorite characters. Then in terms of research, I told you about the woman who worked as a registrar in Kiev during the occupation. Uh, and I was so interested in her that I actually based my character in my second book, which is the sequel to Sisters of War. Uh, one of the main characters based on that woman who was writing those diaries. So how did you decide um, you come up with these great characters? Um, how do you how do you balance um the um the historical accuracy of the events that are going on and the the uh, you know kind of tent pole events that that we all know about with uh you know the the made up story of these characters and and how they you know come in and out of of the 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 historical story um uh, do, do you is there an outline that you use to, to make sure that, you know, you're being factually true to this event and this event? Like, how do you, how do you weave in and out of those things? Uh, yes, I, I, I do have an outline. So I start with a time period. I choose the time period that I want to set my story in. And I do a lot of reading and research. 
And during that research, I get the main idea for the plot, hopefully <laughs> somewhere along the way. And it's it's like building a snowman, really. You start with a small small idea and then you work and work and work on it. It becomes bigger and bigger. It, it has more and more detail. And with the characters, yeah, I'm trying to make them as relatable as possible, as human as possible. Because even during the war, people remained human. People fell in love. People felt all the same emotions that we feel today. And I'm, that's what I'm trying to show in my books, really. So, uh, yeah, and I, I do have an outline of the events as they happened. And then I think, what would it feel like to live through these things? What, what would someone going through this feel? And that's what I'm trying to show in my books. One thing that's really interesting is, um, you know, that you said um, that you're you're trying to to show people's humanity, uh, even in trying situations like this. Um, no matter what circumstances we go through and and where we are, um, we're we're still human, and there's uh, such an array of emotions, and, and you really bring that out in this book um you know there's there's times where you want to um laugh and uh, times that you want to cry and and times that you're you know just exhilarated you know hoping that these characters get out of this situation um how important is it to to show the full range of emotion and to to make sure that these characters uh are believably human i think the more relatable the characters the more human um, the more readers would enjoy the book and the more they would feel the connection with the book. And to me as a writer, that's very important that the reader connects to what I'm trying to say. So, yeah, I think that's that's fairly important that um, I write them as, as human as I possibly can. And not, not just the main characters, but every little character I try to imagine in detail and describe in detail to give them more life. You um you mentioned earlier that um uh that you also wrote a second book um d- does is there more story after Sisters of War? Uh well yes, the second book uh is written from the point of view of the other sister and it talks about what happened to her after we lose track of her in Sisters of War because a lot of people uh got in touch with me and they said oh I love the character of Lisa. I wonder what happened to her. And that made me realize that there's more to the story than I first thought, and I knew I had to write it. And as I was writing the story, I fell absolutely in love with the characters, and I can't wait to share this story with the world. And that should come out in February next year. Oh, I can't wait to see where this story goes. Uh, that's going to be so much fun. Uh, this book is called Sisters of War by uh, Lana Korchik. Um, uh, Lana, we're going to put a link to this uh, book in the show notes of this episode to make it easy for people to find. Um, where can they find you online to to dig into all the great stuff that you do? Uh, my website is lanakorchik.com. I'm also on Instagram, Facebook, uh, Twitter as Lana Kolchik. Excellent. We'll put links uh, to those in the show notes to make it easy for people to find you. Lana, thank you so much uh, for the book, Sisters of War, and for taking time to come on the show. And thank you for having me. Do you ever wonder if a person's critical thinking comes at the expense of their own happiness? Is it possible to be very happy and still practice excellent discernment? I used to wonder the same thing. Then I discovered the Trouble in Paradise podcast with Nigel Kent and Jasmine Starr, where they laugh as well as think about conspiracy theories and unexplained phenomena without ever getting bogged down in the age-old tug-of-war between logic and feeling. The Trouble in Paradise podcast is a joyful program for critical thinkers who have a sense of humor. Join Nigel and Jasmine as they probe the intriguing and wacky culture of odd occurrences, strange news, and ridiculous coincidences on this hilariously intelligent podcast. Trouble in Paradise on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and Stitcher. Follow at TipCast239 on Twitter. Trouble in Paradise with Nigel Ken and Jasmine Starr, a happy podcast for critical thinkers like you.